Extinction. The end of the road. It's a fate that awaits every species on Earth, unless they can adapt to avoid it. Unfortunately, evolution is a painfully slow progress, so most species simply just don't make it. The dinosaurs just weren't quick enough to figure out how to avoid an asteroid impact. Sailor Dew Tigers couldn't figure out the Ice Age, and the poor, poor dodo bird was just massacred by Dutch sailors because it sucked. But what if extinction wasn't the end? What if we could reach beyond the grave and yank a species back to life? The idea of de extinction, which has spawned more than its fair share of blockbuster dinosaur films, actually might be possible. Millions of years ago, an ugly bastard known as the Coelacanth roamed the seas, and it was allowed to do so for more than 300 million years until he went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs. Or at least that's what we all thought based on the fossil records until a fisherman in South Africa suddenly caught one in 1939. Turns out these bony eyesores had faked their death and moved into the witness protection program. Either that or the fossil record was incomplete. One or the other. Regardless, they were back from the grave, but we didn't have anything to do with that. And it's not like they actually even died off in the first place, so we can't really claim it as a species that successfully undergone de-extinction even though it was kind of de-extincted. So, well, let's get into how we might actually be able to resurrect a species of our choice. So, our first option is something called bat breeding. It's a form of artificial selection. Normally when scientists selectively breed a species, they choose a few traits that are advantageous or interesting and then breed animal pairs in an attempt to make these traits more common. A good example of this is modern domesticated livestock, which over the years has generally become more docile, all while getting fatter and fatter. The same goes for dogs, which has allowed us to create some rather interesting creatures that their apex predator wolf ancestors would probably be just a tiny bit ashamed of. What scientists do instead is search for traits or characteristics that resemble an animal's ancestors and then breed these in an attempt to turn back the clock. If successful, this can result in a species that closely resembles its extinct ancestors, perhaps both in appearance and behavior, but its genome is still going to be quite a bit different. A good example of backbreeding is the quagga, a type of zebra that was hunted to extinction in the late 1800s. Quaggas visibly differ from zebras that we all know and love by having a distinct lack of stripes in much of the body, especially in the rear half. Then, in the 1980s, more than a hundred years after the quagga went extinct, researchers in Namibia began the process of backbreeding. After exploring at Tosha National Park, nine zebras were found that had considerably lighter stripes than the rest, and these were taken into a special breeding facility in South Africa where the zebras would spend their days eating, sleeping, and, uh, well, you know the rest. After years of living the dream, the zebras had produced about 116 offspring, six of which showed a very clear lack of stripes on half of their body. Now, this is interesting for sure if you're really into zebras or something, but again, the result was not the quagga. It's a different species that just resembles this new special zebra in appearance. In terms of genetics, hey, it's just not really impressive. All right, so let's get on to the real treat of de-extinction. Replicating the genome of an extinct species to produce as close to an exact copy as we can through genetic engineering. So, first option, cloning. To clone an animal, you first need to get one of its cells and extract its nucleus. That's the little center of the cell that holds all of that genetic information. After you've stolen its insides, you're going to need to make a surrogate mother, ideally as close to the cloned animal as possible. If you take the egg from a surrogate mother and replace its nucleus with the one that you just stole from the other animal's cells, it's possible for an embryo of the cloned animal to begin forming and eventually grow into a living, breathing creature. Which honestly is just f cool. I know it's creepy, but it's also cool. What's utterly insane about this is that the nucleus you take doesn't even need to be from something special like a stem cell because almost all cells in your body contain your full genetic code. Almost any healthy nucleus will do from your skin, your organs, really you just nick it from anywhere. This was shown in the first case of mammalian cloning when scientists at Scotland's Rosslyn Institute successfully cloned Dolly the sheep in 1996. The donated nucleus was taken from a sheep's udder and inserted into a surrogate mother. It took an astounding 435 attempts, but eventually 
eventually, the implantation was successful and the embryo formed and began to grow. Dolly the sheep was born into the world in 1996, and if you're wondering, yes, the scientist named her after Dolly Parton for mammalian reasons. Really? In other words, Dolly is derived from a mammary gland cell, and we couldn't think of a more impressive pair of glands than Dolly Parton's. <laughs> you're supposed to be a scientist, scientist! Dolly lived until the ripe old age of six and a half before she was hit with a knockout combo of arthritis and lung disease and was subsequently euthanized. Now, there was a lot of speculation that her early death, which was about six years earlier than expected, had come as a side effect of the cloning. Some news outlets at the time suggested that her telomeres had been shortened by the process, limiting her lifespan, but this was rejected by researchers and later shown to be false. In fact, there had really been barely any side effects of the cloning. Later cloned sheep had no such issues, including a more made from Dolly's same cell line more than a decade later. Since then, lots of animals have been cloned, like pigs, horses, and even some macaque monkeys. But some scientists in Spain decided to take things just a step further and attempted to clone a Pyrenean ibex, a type of mountain goat that had been declared extinct in the year 2000. Just before they'd gone extinct, one specimen had been captured, and scientists took a few skin samples from her ear, throwing them into a freezer for later. After many attempts, an embryo was successfully created using these frozen goat leftovers, and although the cloned ibex survived birth, becoming the first species to return from the grave thanks to cloning, the newborn goat only survived for a few minutes before succumbing to lung complications. It was a success, to be sure, but even if the goat had managed to survive to adulthood, uh, there were no male counterparts to reproduce with her, so any offspring would have to have been a hybrid with a similar species. In the future, we may be able to get around this by carefully extracting an X chromosome and replacing it with a Y chromosome, but as of today, this probably isn't quite possible. But still, the whole project showed that extinction may not be the end for some species. And indeed, we may be able to get past a few of cloning shortfalls with our second method, genome editing. Technologies like CRISPR have been advancing rapidly in recent years, and so in the near future, we may be able to use new techniques to directly modify the genes of an animal by inserting or deleting sequences so that it produces offspring similar to its ancestors. It's basically getting pretty close. But don't get too excited because we're still a long way off from having entire prehistoric zoos filled with things like T Rexes. The main reason that we're yet to start our very own Jurassic Park, as we've actually covered in a previous video, is mainly due to the fact that DNA just doesn't last that long once an organism has died, and millions of years of fossilization certainly well, they, they damage things. That being said, there are a few interesting critters from more recent times that are prime candidates for de-extinction in the near future. First up was the woolly mammoth, which went extinct nearly 4,000 years ago. Because they mainly inhabited colder parts of the northern hemisphere, many of their remains were conveniently preserved by their frosty environments after death, and several near-complete specimens have been found frozen in the ice of both Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon. While some of them have been dated to nearly 30,000 years old, there is still some hope that these old beasts from the permafrost could provide sufficient DNA to be cloned. Their embryos would likely be carried by their closest living relative, the Asian elephants, but attempts to create an embryo have so far come up empty-handed. Their DNA hasn't been completely destroyed, but it turns out being frozen in ice for longer than a civilization has existed still does do quite a bit of damage. And what's interesting about the woolly mammoth is that we aren't just bringing it back to throw it in a zoo for sweaty tourists to gawk at. Rather, geneticists at Harvard are thinking big and have teamed up with a company called Colossal Biosciences for a rather ambitious project. According to these two, introducing a population of woolly mammoths, or some kind of elephant-mammoth hybrid, could actually help fight climate change. Supposedly, their gargantuan appetite could help clear out layers of dead grass, allowing sunlight to reach grass sooner. In snowy areas, their heavy footprints can also pack down powder, insulating the permafrost and preventing it from melting too soon. This is beneficial because melting permafrost releases greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, so it'd be nice if the mammoths could stay all trapped down there. And apparently they're also known for knocking down trees, which in my thing is a bad thing, but according to the mammoth reviving experts, this would actually help create more clearings for grass to flourish and trap even more carbon in its roots. It's all quite impressive, and the best part is that there's little to no risk involved as the mammoth's size makes it a piece of cake to track them down if we change our minds. Let's go hunting! Next up is the thylacine, better known as the Tasmanian tiger. As you might expect, they largely went extinct thanks to us, as bounty hunting was rampant 
seasons when they were deemed a threat to farmers and their livestock. By the time we eased up on killing them off, it was too little too late, and the last one in captivity died of exposure after accidentally being locked out of its shelter before an abnormally cold night. There have since been hundreds of reported sightings, but despite several million dollar rewards offered for the capture of a live Tasmanian tiger, no evidence of their continued existence has been found. Perhaps the tigers are just that elusive, or maybe the eyewitnesses are about as reliable as those who say they've seen Bigfoot. Either way, because the last Tasmanian tiger died fairly recently, remains of the animal have been well preserved and their entire genome has been sequenced and mapped. A couple of cloning projects have been started and usable genetic material has even been extracted, but the project has always ended up getting cancelled for one reason or another. You might see some news on this soon, though, because a company recently announced a partnership with the University of Melbourne to clone the thylacine and reintroduce it to Tasmania. And by the way, that company is Colossal Biosciences, the same one who were working on woolly mammoths, so that's nice. But they're of course not the only ones. Many institutions around the globe are working hard to bring back dozens of species. Other candidates in the future might include the Caribbean monk seal, the cave lion, the woolly rhinoceros, and maybe even the dodo bird, but only if the Dutch will promise not to eat them all this time. 